I am here to uh, introduce our next speaker. Um, and, uh, and there's a little story that goes with it first. Um, in uh, 2017, a lifetime member extraordinaire of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, Henry Zumach, known as Hank, approached um, to the Freedom From Religion Foundation about creating an endowment um, for a new award called the Freedom From Religious Fundamentalism Award. Note that if you put these together, you get FFRF's FFRF Award. <laughs> Hank has grown um, the endowment, which uh, single-handedly since 2017 with a certain percentage going to the annual award. And um, today the award has grown to $35,000. I'm honored to in, uh, introduce the recipient of the 2022 Henry H. Zumach Freedom From Re Religious Fundamentalism Award, which is going to the ACLU program on freedom of religion and belief accepting the award on the behalf of the program is its director, Dan Mack. Mack leads a wide range of religious liberty litigation, advocacy, and educational uh, efforts nationwide, often writes, teaches, and speaks publicly about religious freedom issues. FFRF attorneys have enjoyed working with uh, Daniel um, Mack, currently, who currently serves as an adjunct professor of law at the George Washington University Law School, focusing on constitutional law and religious liberty. And we know he'll have a lot to say about both of these topics. Please come up, Dan, and accept this plaque and the award uh, on behalf of the ACLU. Here is the plaque, and here is a check. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> um, I appreciated in the, uh, the earlier session just now the question about the God's Not Dead franchise. Um, it's an uh, artistically appalling franchise, uh, leaving aside whatever <laughs> the, the message. But there's one funny bit um, that I often return to in, in uh, I think it was the second of those movies, where the ACLU lawyer is the bad guy. And he's you know, oppressing the, the, the poor teacher who just wants to pass along her faith, public school teacher, to, to her students. Um, and one of, the, one of the, the evil things that the ACLU lawyer does is mock the shoddy outfit of the lawyer on the other side, and of, of, of the, which, which I think is funny since I, you know, my, my regular uniform is a t-shirt and jeans, so this is one of the, the few times you'll actually see me in a, in a jacket, except when I'm in court. So um, yeah, that, that, that to me is, it's one of the, one of the great moments. There, there are many in that. Um, <laughs> Anyway, the, you know, the sun is shining today, the birds are singing, and now I'm gonna try to ruin it all with some good old-fashioned pessimism and a little doomsaying uh, thrown in for good measure. I guess it's only fitting as we stand a stone's throw away from one of the enduring symbols, uh, for better or worse, of defeat and lost causes. <laughs> First, though, I want to thank FFRF and you all uh, for hosting such a wonderful event and for this generous honor. Uh, it's especially rewarding coming from one of our staunchest allies in this monumental struggle to preserve our basic constitutional rights. We at the ACLU can always count on FFRF, whom we view not only as our colleagues, but also our friends and really our family. We are with you walking hand in hand, co-counseling on cases or joining together on amicus briefs, supporting each other's litigation or collectively reminding the government that it should stay out of the religion business.
ours is a special partnership, and it's vital partnership, and it's never been more necessary. As you know all too well, we find ourselves in an unprecedented, dangerous era for religious liberty. And it all starts at the top with the US Supreme Court and its ultra-conservative supermajority. So I'm gonna talk about that a bit today. The justices in that supermajority have embarked on an alarming project to elevate the free exercise of religion, which we at the ACLU value um, highly, but they're elevating it above other crucial rights and constitutional protections. And at the same time, they are engaged in an outright assault on the separation of church and state, which is, of course, a cornerstone of religious freedom. Just this past Supreme Court term, two cases in particular illustrate this disturbing trend. Both were about religion in schools. The first case was called Carson v. Macon, in which the court required the state of Maine to fund private religious education if it supported private secular education. So what was the case about? Briefly, it involved a school voucher type program in Maine, a tuition assistance program, which pays for students in rural areas that don't have their own public high schools to go to another public or private high school. Under the program, the state will pay, but not if the school uses the government funds to finance religious instruction or indoctrination. Now that limitation that the state placed on those funds reflected both the state's longstanding interest in promoting the separation of church and state and the fact that this was a unique program um, that was meant to provide some rough equivalent of a public education to those who can't get it. In June, the Supreme Court ruled six to three, a very common vote obviously at this point, that the state's restriction on that funding violated the federal free exercise clause because it supposedly discriminated against religion. Now, why is this a problem? When it comes to government funding of religion, the script has been completely flipped in the past, the court used to guard against government-funded religion, and for good reason. Shielding taxpayers from compulsory support of religion lies at the heart of the Constitution's religious liberty protections. In fact, James Madison, the principal architect of the First Amendment, explicitly warned against government funding religion, including government funding of religious education, because it would be the first step, he feared, in permitting the state to force citizens to conform to the preferred faith of those in power. Now, though, the court isn't just allowing such funding, it is requiring it. And the main case, Carson, went further than ever before. In two earlier decisions, bad ones, to be sure, <laughs> the court had held that states couldn't deny funding solely on the basis of the recipient's religious status, that is, just because they themselves were religious. But in Carson, the court expanded that rule to prevent states from denying funding based on the religious uses of the money, including religious instruction or indoctrination. And this is all, as I said, despite the fact that not too long ago, the court recognized that such funding could violate the Establishment Clause, which protects the separation of church and state. As the dissents in that case warned, we're now not at a point only where the court is ignoring the separation of religion and government, which would be bad enough. The court now thinks that protecting that vital separation is somehow its own constitutional violation. And so that further limits what states can do on their own to protect us all when the federal co courts are falling short, which they're doing all too often these days. Um, now the other truly dangerous religion decision from last term was a case called Kennedy versus Bremerton. In Kennedy, the court held that a public school had to allow its football coach to pray at the 50 yard line after games. 
Now this case is problematic for so many reasons. <laughs> um, I don't have time to get into them all right now, um, but here are a few. First of all, the court's uh, six-person uh, supermajority did the same thing that they did in the main case that I just mentioned. So they decided that well-meaning efforts by the government, which in this case was the public school, to maintain church-state separation have now become their own constitutional violation. The case is also a telling example of the lengths to which this new majority on the court will go to advance its crusade, playing fast and loose with the facts when it suits them, even when there's photographic evidence to the contrary, like there was in this case. In the Kennedy decision, the majority adopted what one lower court called a deceitful narrative that had been spun by the coach and his lawyers. So in the case, the Supreme Court described the coach's prayers as personal and quiet, but they were nothing of the sort. Uh, the coach delivered his prayers audibly at the 50-yard line, immediately after games, and often surrounded by students. And in fact, in the court decision itself, there are pictures that show this. Um, the majority also said that the coach had given up any intent to pray with his students. But in fact, he repeatedly demanded that he be able to continue praying with his students, even saying that he was, quote, helping these kids be better people. The court also claimed that no students were coerced into the prayer. But the record in the case shows that at least some of the players and their families complained and they said that they participated in this prayer with the coach only to avoid separating themselves from the team and suffering all of the possible consequences that can come with that, like losing playing time. And regardless, that misses the point. As the Supreme Court had recognized for over 50 years before that, just forcing students to make that choice, putting them in that position to choose between joining your teacher or your coach in prayer or choosing not to and making a public protest and sending that message to someone who has such authority over you, just putting students to that choice is inherently coercive and therefore unconstitutional. That's what the court had acknowledged many times. Not this time. Now maybe one of the biggest bombshells of this coach case, the Kennedy case, was that the court finally scrapped what um, was known as the lemon test for determining whether there is a violation of the Establishment Clause, whether the separation of church and state has been breached. That test, dating back to the 70s, has had its critics over the years, but it's generally served the cause of religious freedom pretty well over the years. Not anymore. In the Kennedy case, the court took the final step of killing that test and its offshoot, something known as the endorsement test. And maybe, maybe showing at least a little bit of embarrassment at how many landmark cases the court has been overturning lately, the court pretended in the Kennedy case that the lemon test was already dead before this case. They said it had long since abandoned the test, even though th that was just not true. Um, but they didn't want to come out and say, okay, here's another one we're overruling. Anyway, now it'll be much harder to show that a government action or policy violates the separation of church and state. It's now not enough to prove that a, say, a government religious display or government-sponsored prayer has the purpose or has the effect of promoting or endorsing religion. As, as had been the case under the Lemon Test, which um, you know, had been in place for the past 50 years. So what's the new test that the court gives us to replace this Lemon Test? The court only offers vague suggestions. We sh the court says we should determine whether the Establishment Clause has been violated by reference to, quote, historical practices and understandings. Historical practices and understandings. What does that mean? The court doesn't say. The court doesn't even try. But if other cases are any indication, history might mean everything 
from what the founders supposedly thought about a specific religious practice to some hopelessly malleable notion that, about the country's overall commitment to religious exercise. And if that is what historical practices and understandings mean, um, then government action promoting religion could almost always be found constitutional. Anything goes, maybe, unless the government is actually, and some of the justices believe that, unless the government is actually forcing you to attend church or forcing you to profess religious beliefs with the threat of criminal or civil penalties. Yeah, it's scary. And, and I fear that we are going to see a lot more blatant religious favoritism by the government very soon. Now, unfortunately, those are not the only bad develops, developments in the Supreme Court, as you all know. <laughs> um, there are some bad recent ones. Obviously, there is the radical Dobbs decision, which overturned Roe v. Wade. Now, while that technically is not a religion case, I think, I think you can um, see why religious favoritism is looming in the background of that case. So, you know, in, in, you all know about Dobbs, I'm sure, but, you know, this was a shameful revocation of a vital constitutional right. And the court's uh, conservative majority effectively sanctioned an understanding of abortion that is largely associated with particular religious viewpoints with no regard for the fact that followers of other faiths and or none believe that access to abortion is essential for all. You know, as we know, there is a wide diversity of faith perspectives and non-faith perspectives about abortion. Yet, immediately after Dobbs, many lawmakers are rushing to codify just one set of religious views at the expense of all others, including the non-religious. The, the extreme conservatives have gotten so used to having their way on the Supreme Court that they cannot fathom a loss, even a minor procedural one. So take the recent dispute, which you may have read about, uh, over Yeshiva University in New York, where an LGBTQ student group has been denied recognition by the school solely because it's an LGBTQ student group. Um, so what does that mean? They can't hold meetings on campus. They don't have access to um, bulletin boards or the listserv at the school to announce their activities. And so they went to court. And this is in state court that they first went to. Um, now, a few facts are, are important to know here. First of all, an LGBTQ student club has existed at the, the Yeshiva Law School, Cardozo, for decades. And also, Yeshiva's own policies publicly guarantee equal treatment under New York City's human rights law. And for those reasons and, and others, the, the, the lower court in the state ruled for the student group. They said that uh, the human rights law applied, the civil rights law applied, and that the school had to recognize the group. So the group went straight up to the Supreme Court seeking emergency relief. They said, please help us, you gotta fix this. And maybe a little surprisingly, the Supreme Court denied that emergency relief, but don't get your hopes up too much on this. The, the denial was just based on procedural grounds. It had nothing to do with the actual merits of the case. It was all about the procedural hoops that the school should have jumped through but didn't before going to the Supreme Court. So you have to do certain things before you just try to go straight and skip over everything, go to the Supreme Court. The school didn't do that and the Supreme Court said, okay, do that first. And then once you've done that, you can come back to us. So that doesn't seem like a big deal, right? The, the, the court didn't say anything about the substance of the case. And yet, there is a fairly angry dissent um, written by Justice Alito on behalf of, of uh, four justices 
complaining basically that the sky was falling for the ultra conservatives. They couldn't believe this was going on. And they, they characterized what the student group was doing as asking New York to enforce the state's preferred interpretation of Torah, of scripture, which was not what was going on in this case at all. But nonetheless, the conservatives were so up in arms in the court, they called it a shocking development, and they promised that when things got back up there, we'll rule for the school, don't you, don't you worry, is what, what they said. So, so even a slight bump in the road for them is treated as, as some dramatic, shocking development. Um, now, all of these recent cases in the Supreme Court follow on the heels of action in recent years to, again, elevate religious exercise above other rights and civil liberties. So, for example, the courts relatively recently sided with a social service provider who, for religious reasons, discriminated uh, against uh, couples who wanted to be foster parents. Um, the group wouldn't certify them because they said certifying gay couples was against their religious beliefs. This is one of our cases. Um, disclaimer. Uh, and the court said, ru ruled for, this, for the service provider. It said that they, they had a right to get the contract with the city of Philadelphia and to continue discriminating against families. In, an, in a related matter, um, there, you know, the court has sided with businesses who say they don't want to, you know, this is the Hobby Lobby case, which you probably know about, say they don't want to provide certain insurance coverage that's required by the Affordable Care Act um, for religious reasons. They don't want to cover contraception. So, you know, for their employees. This is the same Supreme Court that, at the height of the pandemic, gave churches um, a religious exemption from health and safety measures, the height of the COVID pandemic. And let's be clear, the court isn't just elevating religion over non-religion, which of course would be bad enough. Um, it has this automatic embrace only of certain types of religion claims. So compare two cases from a few years back. First, the Masterpiece Cake Shop case you know, this is another one where we, where we were on the losing side. That seems to be a theme here. Um, the, there was a bakery that discriminated against our clients, a same-sex couple that wanted a wedding cake. The court sided with the bakery, and the reason given was that the, the court said that the process, so in none of these cases, just to be clear, has the court come out and said, yes, there is a blanket religious right to discriminate. So there, there are a lot of nuances in a bunch of these cases. In this one, the court said the process was tainted. The process was anti-religion. Um, why? For, for one thing, some of the government officials involved in enforcing Colorado's anti-discrimination laws had made some statements that the court said were so blatantly hostile to religion that they tainted the entire process. Here are the statements, here's one. Quote, it is one of the most despicable pieces of rhetoric that people can use to use their religion to hurt others. Um, another one, this is another statement that was cited, that the, the, the baker, this is a statement made again by, by the officials in the state who are enforcing the civil rights laws. The baker can believe what he wants to believe, but he can't act on that belief and discriminate if he decides to do business in this state. Okay, that was it. Now, despite the fact that there was clear discrimination against um, gay couples, the court said that those statements and other parts of the process showed, showed such hostility that the entire process was tainted and we can't enforce the civil rights laws in that case. That same year, very close in time to that decision, the court upheld President Trump's Muslim ban. 
even though Trump had explicitly and repeatedly disparaged Muslims and Islam. He said, for example, that, quote, Islam hates us, and, quote, we're having problems with Muslims coming into the country, and then he formally called, he actually called explicitly for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States. Okay, this is an entire faith that he's singled out and said we're keeping them out of the country. And then he enacted a ban that had pretty much that effect. What did the court do? It let it slide. It upheld the ban. So I guess anti-religious hostility is a problem, except when it isn't. <laughs> so, okay, thus far I've focused on the Supreme Court. But the lower courts have seen their fair share of mischief, too. Uh, last month, in an FFRF case, a federal court of appeals actually allowed a judge to open, it was a justice of the peace here in Texas, to, to lock his doors and open court sessions with a prayer ceremony. And a, a federal panel amazingly said that was fine and said it was not coercive. Keep in mind what's going on here. This is a prayer ceremony. If you want to excuse yourself, you have to let the court know then the doors are locked. And then you have to appear before this judge who started the prayer cer ceremony. The, 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 the federal court said that's fine, it's not coercive. Um, you know, as always, FFRF there is fighting the good fight, but um, you, you see what, what we're all up against here. Um, a federal judge, also here in Texas, ruled that in employers who have religious objections to provide coverage for PrEP, for medication for HIV prevention, um, don't have to provide that coverage because of their religious objections, even though it's required by the Affordable Care Act. Uh, that same judge ruled for plaintiffs challenging another ACA rule. This time it was an H HHS regulation clarifying that the Affordable Care Act bars healthcare entities from, the ones that receive federal funds, it bars them from discriminating against patients and employees because they are transgender or because they seek reproductive care. The list goes on. And back to schools, returning to that issue for a second. Religion issues remain hotly contested in public schools, and kids are often bearing the brunt of this. As, for example, in the growing number of cases where public school teachers are claiming a religious right to misgender students. And also in, in public schools, just garden variety, old school, violations of the separation of church and state remain. Um, they're, they're prevalent despite the fact that the Supreme Court has, you know, again, <laughs> before recent times, had said clear rules. I mean, this goes back to the seminal schools, religion cases in the 1960s. Since then, it has been absolutely clear that public schools teachers and staff cannot lead kids in prayer, and generally that public schools can't favor or promote religious doctrine. But despite that, blatant and widespread problems pers persist, and even though the rules have been straightforward for, for over a half century. I'll just give you a few examples of that. There are, there are so many. They're all too common, these cases. We had a case in Tennessee, school events, regularly featured Christian prayer. Every week, the middle school principal instructed students to pray. One teacher read her students' Bible verses every morning. Biblical quotes on the walls, messages posted throughout the school with religious content, and a large Latin cross was painted on the wall of the school gym. Another situation in Louisiana, the Lord, they read the Lord's Prayer over the PA system. Again, I'm talking about public schools here, not private schools. Every morning, prayer was incorporated into nearly all school events, 
And when our client de declined to stand for the Lord's Prayer, she was harassed by her classmates and called the devil. School officials called evolution a fairy tale and urged students to take the Bible literally. Um, and they were mocked. Our clients were mocked when they even questioned this. Different, another parish in Louisiana, another, another case a few years earlier, our client, who was, um, who was a Thai Buddhist sixth grader, talking about a sixth grader, his science teacher said, uh, it, you know, promoted creationism in class, told students that the Big Bang never happened and that the universe was created by God approximately 6,000 years ago, ca called evolution impossible and stupid, and that stupid people made it up because they don't want to believe in God. And then this was the proof that they're right and, and evolution is wrong. If evolution was real, the teacher said, it would still be happening. Apes would be turning into human beings. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and just the, one, one final example of this kind of thing, and this time in South Carolina. There were rampant violations in the school. School officials were promoting religion at every turn, but it was culminated in an evangelical revival assembly that, was, that had the stated purpose of saving students. Again, reminder, public school we're talking about. So this it was a full day event. Um, it featured a minister who delivered a sermon, a Christian rapper, um, and church members who prayed with students. And students at the event were urged to sign a pledge dedicating themselves to Christ. Students who didn't attend the revival were forced to spend the afternoon in the in-school suspension room. And, you know, sometimes these things are hard to prove. Sometimes, they, you know, students tell us what happened and then the school denies it all. In that case, um, the Christian rapper himself was so proud of the event that he filmed it all and posted it <laughs> online. So, so that was helpful. <laughs> uh, now, these cases are just, just the tip of the ice, iceberg. Um, they're the cases where we have families who are brave enough to step forward to complain. Um, now, in, in some of the more recent, the, the, the last few examples I gave, the schools caved after we sued. Um, so the family, for example, in the South Carolina case, they won their case, but at great personal sacrifice. They were harassed. At their home, they received death threats. Their dog was poisoned. Um, and they couldn't get jobs. They lost a bunch of job opportunities. And they eventually had to leave town. And, and things like that happen in many of these cases. In the Louisiana case, as a result of the school official's conduct, our client was bullied and became so physically ill that they couldn't attend school. And they had to transfer school and go 25 miles away. The family was targeted for harassment, including people showing up dressed in KKK hoods. Yeah, so that's some of the bad news. Where does that leave us? Well, the good news is that we will never give up the fight. Our rights are too precious, and we, and you, and everyone in this country who cares about their liberties will not back down. First of all, we won't back down in the courts. We're gonna keep fighting there too. Take the issue of prayer in schools, for example. As I mentioned earlier, the Supreme Court's majority in that Kennedy case, in the Coach case, went out of its way to embrace this narrative, this deceitful narrative about, about what actually happened. So the court pretended, contrary to the evidence, that the coach was only asking to give quiet, personal, solitary prayer. Now that was all an absolute fiction, as the lower courts recognized. But now, here we are, we should take the court at its word. I know that's tough to do. Um, you know, the decision is deeply problematic, but it's not a blank check for public schools to impro impose prayer on students. 
Public schools still have a duty to serve students of all faiths and those of none, and significant constitutional restrictions remain on school employees' ability to impose prayer on students or otherwise promote religion to them. So in that Kennedy case, the court upheld the right of the coach only, and this is important, only to engage in a quiet and private act of prayer that was not endorsed by the school, again, this is according to what the court said, not endorsed by the school, that prayer that fell outside the coach's official responsibilities did not involve or coerce students and was not imposed on a captive audience. Again, leaving aside what actually happened, this is what the court pretended happened. So all of those elements were critical to the decision and staff prayers that don't share those features are still unconstitutional like they've been for over a half century. And more broadly, on the court's new vague standard that I mentioned for determining whether the separation of church and state has been violated, this historical practices and understandings test, there, there too, there's still a lot we can do. In fact, the Supreme Court has in many cases over the years including going back to the 40s, already engaged in a historical analysis of what the founders of this country believed about religion and what should or shouldn't be allowed when it comes to government religious favoritism. So in doing so, in all of those prior cases, the court repeatedly reaffirmed, based on this historical analysis, looking at what the founders thought, the idea that the government has to be neutral, not only among religions, but also between religion and non-religion. So we'll all continue to argue that, that the historical work has largely been done already by the court, which is not to say that the court won't shift gears or ignore all of that compelling analysis that it did in prior cases, but it's just a way of saying we're hardly operating on a blank slate. In other words, all is not lost in the courts, at least not yet. Now that said, we need to continue to fight outside the courts too, maybe now more than ever. In legislatures, in op-eds, in town halls, on street corners, at the dinner table, we need to tell them that it is not okay to treat everyone who's not a member of the religious majority as a second-class citizen. It is not okay to throw out half a century of precedent simply because you now have the votes. It's not okay to pretend to rely on some idea of what the founders of our nation originally thought about religious liberty and then completely forget about the fact that the key players in the adoption of the Constitution way back when and the First Amendment, they themselves recognized that religious belief or non-belief is too precious to be left in the hands of government officials. And it's not okay for politicians, judges, judges, legislators, to give a free pass to employers, to businesses or healthcare providers to discriminate in the name of religion and impose their faith on others. It's not okay and we will all keep fighting to make sure they know it. Thank you. Yeah, so, thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we have time for questions, um, so happy to entertain any. We will be walking around with a mic for those who don't feel comfortable standing in line. Uh, and this is just a friendly reminder to ask a question and not tell a personal story. You can tell our speakers personal stories once they're off the stage, if they're willing. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Tom Waddell, the president of the main chapter of the Freedom uh, Office, the main, the main chapter. 
I want you to know that the main chapter is actively opposing the Casey versus Macon decision. The, that decision only uh, of forcing states to pay for religious schools only applies to schools that pay for private secular schools but exclude religious schools. We have already sent a letter to every legislator in the state and after November 8th, once we know who our new legislators are, we're going to do it again. And our position is to encourage the state of Maine to no longer fund private schools. So that, I didn't really have a question, but I wanted to let you know that I am from Maine, we're very well aware of Casey versus Bacon, and that we're actively opposing that. Thank you. Good, thank you. And keep up the good work on that. Yeah. One, one additional thing there, one thing the court left open in that bad decision was the state's ability to say, we will not fund schools that discriminate. So they did not, they, they, they forbade the state from saying we will not fund schools that use the money to engage in religious indoctrination or other sorts of religious education. They, they said you have to fund that, but they did not say you have to fund schools that discriminate against students in various ways. So that's still an open question. Thank you for all the work the ACLU does. Um, I've been a practicing attorney in California for 40 years, and I, I have a question that always comes to mind when I read these cases. Take the Philadelphia social service case, for example. On the one side, you have real people who are being denied access to adopt. On the other side, you have a mythical belief that's stopping them. Has that ever been raised that way in a federal case other than maybe the Scopes trial? I'm sorry, could you, could you uh, repeat? Well, you have, on the one side, a gay couple. On the other side, you have the Catholic Church, okay? The gay couple are real people. They bleed, they work, they, you know, they're human beings. On the other side, you have a belief that's based on no facts whatsoever and it's giving credence over real people's lives. Has that ever been raised that way <laughs> in court? Uh, yes, in various forms. Uh, you know, the, the Supreme Court wasn't, wasn't buying it, um, but you're absolutely right. I mean, I couldn't agree with you more that, that, that you know, that this is a problem that's going on in, in the full, the, for those who want to know the name of the case, it's Fulton, Fulton right. versus the city of Philadelphia. Yeah, that's what was going on in that case. Um, and I, I just want to be clear about one thing, and I mentioned this earlier, but it's, it bears repeating. The court didn't say that this social services organization has an absolute right to discriminate. It based its decision on some tiny procedural, not, not quite procedural thing, but something in the contract that the city had um, with all of its providers. The contract, um, the city had what the court, Supreme Court viewed as absolute discretion to decide whether or not to give exemptions. So the Supreme Court said, well, if you have absolute discretion to decide whether or not to give exemptions, you can't then deny this religious group an exemption. Now, the city had never actually granted anyone an exemption from its non-discrimination rules, but the case hinged on the idea that the city could have given them an exemption. So we have argued in cases since then that anytime you have a situation without such discretion to grant exemptions from civil rights laws, then the rule doesn't apply. The um, minutia regarding all of the various cases that you just so amply demonstrated that you were able to interpret and apply to a case. And I feel like a lot of this is a waste of time and money because, and I, and I would hate to see FFRS or you know, money wasted for that because it all is based on a good faith interpretation by a judge who's going to evenly apply the law. And what are we doing about our answer to the Federalist Society? This stuff has been going on for decades. They're packing of the courts. What is our answer to that? Because I don't wanna see 
all these cases go on with these Christian judges who, what's the point? You know how they're going to judge, you know, how they're going to rule in advance. What is our answer to the Federalist Society? That's my question. Sure. It's a good question. There are, there are a variety of groups that are, that are trying to do um, from the other side what the Federalist Society has done, which is to ensure that the judiciary um, is made up of people who actually respect um, the Constitution and not one particular set of viewpoints. It's, you know, it's all politics. I mean, a lot of what is going on here is um, baked into the structure of our, of our system here, and we know it's pretty precarious when we're talking about voting rights and, and things like that. Um, so, so some of what we need to do is you know, speak with our vote on this and, and support candidates who respect the separation of church and state, who respect civil liberties. Um, there are efforts to try to ensure that judges who, who do respect the Constitution are appointed, but, uh, you know, a lot of it boils down to who's in power at any given moment. Good morning. Uh, thank you for your excellent work, your excellent speech. Uh, and uh, I'd like to thank the FFRF uh, legal team and everybody here at the convention for uh, every smiling atheist for helping me to uh, talk me off the ledge because this role reversal and the Bremerton case is like a simultaneous punch to the throat and the solar plexus and I... <laughs> Uh, depending on the midterm elections, I think that the American experiment might be over. My question is, do you happen to know Amanda Scott? She's a friend of FFRF and, uh, yep. okay. And uh, uh, what was my other question? <laughs> I forgot, thank you very much. <laughs> my pleasure. It looks like the time's run out. I'm happy to, to field another, maybe a final question. I've been a card carrier uh, for the ACLU since I was old enough to vote at 18. You, to look at my ID, you have to uh, look at my ACLU card uh, before. <laughs> when I was younger, the ACLU stood up for the KKK to ensure their right for marching and having parades. Since then, the ACLU seems to have taken on a liberal bent that may not include defending the rights of conservative groups. Is that, is that your position now, that the ACLU would not defend conservative groups? No, not at all. We, we defend conservative groups all the time. Um, we defend uh, religious groups who spew hateful messages um, as long as they have a right to do so on, a, on street corners. We defend groups who protest us, the ACLU, who think that we're wrong. Um, yeah, and, and that too, our continued defense of folks whom we don't agree with doesn't please everyone either uh, at the ACLU. But no, that's absolutely something that we feel strongly about and will continue to do. Let's, let's keep going. Um, I, yeah, and it, we'll, we'll, whoever's online, I'm happy to answer any of your questions, and let's, let's, uh, we can end it after that. Hi there. Thank you so much for your work. Uh, I will be brief. Uh, what do you think can be done with respect to compelling recusal of Justice Thomas for <laughs> the political activities of his wife? Yeah, it's, that's a very good question. Um, the, the rules that apply to judges about when they must recuse themselves do not apply to the Supreme Court. So it's a matter of the court policing itself. And, you know, there, at this stage, there's not much that, that we can do about that, except the kind of thing that I was mentioning before, and you may be cynical about that, and it, it, you, it's understandable if you are, but I think it is vital that we all continue to speak up about injustices. And if those injustices relate to 
a perception that the court is uh, not being neutral, we need to say so. Beyond that, I'm not, I'm not sure. I think it's just a matter of continued public pressure. Yeah, I'm Beth Blick from St. Paul, Minnesota. And I know that you mentioned that in some places people have been uh, suspended for refusing to go along with uh, forced religious activities. Have they also been expelled at other times? So you're, you're asking, have students been expelled? Yes. Yeah, I mean, we, we've heard stories of students saying that they were punished in various ways. I mean, maybe expelled, I can't think of a recent example, but if someone then raised their hand and said, actually, I know of five, I would not be shocked. But <laughs> offhand, I, I don't know of, of that type of example. But there is definitely a wide range of coercion going on in public schools uh, when it comes to religion. And, and that, that's not just peer pressure, but it's pressure by school officials and, and the like. All around the country, from the lowest offices to the highest, uh, incumbency depends on an oath, which is more and more frequently, provably uh, violated. Is there anything that could be do on a fundamental level about uh, swearing people in and then catching them not doing what they swore to do? Can they be impeached? Is there something about the electoral process that can maybe tighten down on these people? Using the oath that people take, the oath of office? I, I, yeah. It, it rarely happens that anyone says, well, you promised not to do this thing, and you swore not to do this thing. Um, therefore, you're now accountable. I mean, you, frankly, you, public officials should be accountable whether or not they swear an oath. And one important thing, side note about oaths, which I'm sure you all know, is you have every right not to swear on any deity. Um, but having, having sworn the oath, Yes, you, you theoretically should be held to that oath. Whether there's a cause of action for that, that's a little more difficult. I think the cause of action really rests in the violation of the Constitution or whatever statutes apply. Thank you for your talk. Um, I have a couple questions about abortion restrictions actually violating others' religious beliefs. And it's my, it's my understanding that there are Jewish groups in Florida, there's also the Satanic Temple that have started litigation um, to, um, to get exemptions from those, those abortion restrictions in certain states. Can you tell me what you think would be the outcome of such litigation? Is it likely to succeed? Thank you. It's a good question. Uh, there, there, and I, I think most people heard the question, but there, there are a number of lawsuits right now asserting religious challenges to abortion restrictions. Um, it's too early to tell where those are going to go. Some of those are based on what I'll call free exercise type challenges. You, you are viol you know, the plaintiffs say, you are violating my faith because my faith tells me that a woman has a right to decide for herself what happens with her own body and my, my faith, you're violating my faith by doing that. Some of those claims are more, I'll put in the, in the bucket of establishment clause type claims, which is to say, and, and I touched on this earlier in my remarks, the state is violating the separation of church and state by taking sides on this essentially religious question about when life begins and all the rest and the state can't be doing that. There, there, there have been a, a one or two lower court decisions that have uh, embraced that view. A similar, a similar claim was made um, 40 years ago and the US Supreme Court rejected that argument. It, the Supreme Court said, well, just because these abortion restrictions happen to coincide re with some religious views, that doesn't automatically mean they violate the separation of church and state. So what, what's happening now is some of these claims are being made, most of these claims are being made in state courts under state constitutions, but we'll just have to wait and see uh, what, what happens with those. 
Okay, um, two more questions, and then I think we're good to go. Hi there, thank you so much for the, what the ACLU has been doing. I've been following the Establishment Clause for about 20 years because I've been uh, working with uh, social studies teachers on the issue of handling uh, religion in the public schools. And of course, when the Bremerton decision came down and the, and the Carson-Macon, which I had forecasted about a year ago, <laughs> Uh, to a free thought group, watch out, it's coming, it's going to be terrible. Uh, I was not <laughs> wrong about that. Um, and I found out in working with social studies teachers how much I depended on the Establishment Clause and the concept of legal neutrality. I imagine everybody in this group has probably heard, oh, religious liberty, it's for religion. You know, I think the language works against us. And I found out that with teachers, it was very effective to call it conscience liberty instead of religious liberty, because conscience liberty, in the, you know, like uh, Roger Williams, it belongs to everybody. Do you think the language has anything to play in these decisions and the concept that people think, oh, religious liberty is for religion? rather than for the conscience of this, uh, the person, the, the citizen. Yes, I do think language matters. Um, you know, one of the reasons that you may have heard in the, when I was introduced that, that the, the religion department at the National ACLU, um, of which I'm the director, the official title is the ACLU Program on Freedom of Religion and Belief. And belief was added specifically for reasons similar to the ones mentioned, which is to say we're talking about not just religion, but the right not to have religion, the right to not believe as well. Um, I make a point, and you may have heard me do it today, of including the separation of church and state and the freedom from religion, the right not to believe, in my concept of religious freedom and religious liberty. And I do that because I think it's important to remind people that those things protect religious liberty as much as the right to exercise one faith is the, one's faith. It's, it's the right to make sure the government doesn't tell us what to believe and what not to believe. So, and I, we didn't make this up. I mean, this comes from Thomas Jefferson, James Madison. They didn't view these as two things separate over here. They viewed them as all part of a unified whole, and, and we do too. Now, it's true that most, when you, when you hear religious freedom, most people out there will think, oh, well, that means the right to practice my religion. But I want to remind everyone that that also includes the right not to practice your religion, the right not to have the government tell you what you need to believe. It seems to me that in the current state of the world, uh, the United States is behind other countries in protections to personal privacy. In the EU, they have enacted laws to make sure that even uh, private entities like businesses are able to um, be forced to remove certain information. Um, they're doing more to guarantee from a, a government perspective that people have a right to privacy. And here, it seems that that right is very implicit. It's come up. Um, in relation to other cases and issues such as abortion in the past, but do you think that there's an opportunity, is there a pathway for more, us to more explicitly codify privacy rights in our country? What's that pathway look like? Yeah, there, there have been efforts to do so, and sometimes those efforts are modeled um, on, on European measures. I will tell you that, that um, in talking to the younger generations, including my kids, they, Things like online privacy, they seem not to care at all about it. <laughs> um, so I think it's going to be harder as time goes on, not easier, just because there is a whole generation that feels that they don't need that sort of privacy. Now, I think they might view bodily autonomy, like when we're talking about um, reproductive rights, the right to contraception, that sort of thing. They'll view that as something entirely different. They, they think that is, continues to be extremely important. But uh, other types of privacy, like, like the ability to track what you've been doing online, um, that's going to be a lot tougher as time goes on. Okay, thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. And thanks for having me.